Let's try that. So uh, to recap, we have this system because uh, the founding fathers were concerned about widespread communication. They were concerned about uh, people's lack of information. They were afraid of people getting carried away and making poor decisions. So they created a Republican form of government. And that's why what we have what we have today. So the original idea here was is that the Electoral College would be, in fact, a college of learned persons who would then decide on who would be president. So really, the original conception was is that you were voting for actual electors and that they would choose a president. Uh, so almost instantly, that began to unravel. So in the 1789 election, in which the electors unanimously chose George Washington uh, already um, in Pennsylvania and Maryland, they were putting forth slates of electors who were already pledged to vote for one candidate or another. Now, while Madison and Alexander Hamilton didn't like this, this was pretty much what happened right away. Originally in a lot of the states, uh, legislators, the state legislature would choose the electors and that that went on 1824, six of the states that was still true. By 1832, only South Carolina was still using its legislature to choose electors and they kept that up until 1860. So um, let's see, if nobody wins, uh, it goes to the House of Representatives. Every state gets, in essence, one vote. That hasn't happened since 1824. Every time there's a close election, you hear about, oh, this is a big risk. It's never happened. George Wallace was hoping that would happen in 1968, that he'd be able to control the South and get some concessions, but never, never got close. Uh, Another little side note about democracy in 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 standard U.S. history texts, you hear uh, the the Democratic Party originally referred to as the Democratic Republicans. They never called themselves that. The party of Jeff Jefferson was the Republicans, and they didn't change their name until 1828, and called themselves Democrats, founded by supporters of Andrew Jackson. Um, uh, another historical theory is that the Electoral College was created uh, to please the save states uh, in, in, in that because of the god-awful three-fifths rule. African-Americans were only counted as three-fifths of a person. Uh, but in fact, prominent opponents of a national popular vote came from free states. So that's certainly not true. In any case, uh, this is the system that we've had ever since. Um, let's see. Originally, electors cast two votes uh, for president, and whoever came in second was the vice president. And then the election in 1800 was deadlocked between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. And uh, ultimately, the 12th Amendment separated the votes for president and vice president in 1803. So we got rid of that problem. Uh, pretty quickly. Um, elections were often carried out by district, but for the most part, that's no longer true. Um, states rapidly moved towards a system where slates of electors pledged to one candidate were chosen by citizens. Um, as I said, very few faithless electors. Uh, it seems to violate the one person, one vote rule, but then so does the U.S. Senate. I mean, that's a pretty hard and fast rule. The Supreme Court in a couple of different decisions has basically said electoral districts have to be the same size. But if we look at the Electoral College, we find very small states have really as many votes as states that are larger than them at, to an extent. I mean, Congressional districts within a state have to be, for example, within 1% of each other. Same thing with state legislative districts or city council districts if your city has those. So, uh, and 51% and of the Senate, um, um, you can get to that with only 17% of the people in the country. So these, these are issues that we face. It, it, 
it, in the one hand, you know, having having a minority being able to control things is, is a check on power. On the other hand, it's a it's an impediment to progress. You have to decide whether which of those things you think is more important. And they're neither one to be completely ignored. Uh, the other problem that we that we have with the Electoral College, one of the conditions that's really no longer true is that uh, voters are no longer totally uninformed as they might have been in 1789. Uh, so the conditions that obtained at the time of the founding were, are no longer relevant. I pretty much think most people who vote have some idea of who they're voting for. So and and we no longer run the risk of the election being divided between favorite son candidates from multiple states. So uh, it it involves the whole country in the election, which is which is not a bad thing. On the other hand, it really does limit serious campaigning to um, a handful of swing states. You know that might go either way. I mean that's where the elections won or lost. Um, so that that changes the nature of campaigning and and encourages candidates to think about a rather narrow set of interests in trying to get elected. So um, some reformers have proposed what they call the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, uh, under which states pass elections, pass legislation that binds their electors to support the national popular vote winner. Uh, for the compact to take effect, states would have to collectively represent at least 270 electoral college votes, the bare minimum necessary to win. Uh, as of this writing, uh, 16 states uh, representing 196 electoral votes have signed on. I don't, I just don't see this happening, you know? I mean, it, it's hard for me to imagine most states simply sort of saying, well, we'll, we'll do whatever uh, and, until everybody else has to, right? So um, it works. Uh, it doesn't work perfectly. Uh, we have had a small number of elections, two in the last five, where the the winner of the electoral college vote lost the popular vote. As one of my colleagues at a much bigger school said, it's hard to justify a system where this happens. So, but it happened in 1824, uh, also 1876, 1888, 2000 and 2016. And of course, every time this happens, that's when people start saying, well, we need to do something else. Uh, in addition, Another 14 presidential elections, uh, ranging from 1844 to 1996, uh, the winner received a plurality, but not a majority of the total popular votes cast. And if we look at simply the 1992 election, when that was true, H. Ross Perot ran as a third party candidate and uh, Bill Clinton ended up getting elected for the first time, defeating George H.W. Bush. Now, the talk at the time was that if not for Perot, Bush gets reelected, but it, but in fact, research shows that um, that uh, Perot voters were pretty evenly split between Bush and Clinton. What it did mean was that um, Clinton did not take office with a, with a particularly strong mandate. At least it looked that way from the popular vote, and Congress sort of ignored him. Uh, as a consequence, the Democrats didn't get a lot done for two years. Republicans took control of Congress in the 1994 elections, and that really changed outcomes for the next several years. So big thing, big states tend to think that it helps them, and small states tend to think that it helps them. Um, uh, it, is, it is fundamentally anti-democratic in that regard. On the other hand, it preserves the role of the states in choosing a president. Some people say that it helps prevent sectionalism, that all the attention would go to the populous parts of the country. Um, I don't know. It's unpopular with more than half of Americans. Um, um, on the other hand, changing it wouldn't be easy, right? You, you need to get a constitutional amendment passed and that takes a two thirds vote of the House and the Senate plus uh, uh, 
38 states have to then approve it. The other alternative would be to have a new constitutional convention. Now, I have read people who I assumed were perfectly learned say that you could limit a constitutional convention to a small number of subjects. I just don't see how that's possible. I think if you have a constitutional convention, uh, you're opening up you know, the, the whole can of worms there. And uh, it frightens me to think in our current climate, what we might do to say basic civil liberties, you, you may disagree. Uh, I'm just not convinced that that's a particularly great idea. So we're probably stuck with this for a while. And, and as long as in most elections, the popular vote winner is in fact the, the, the winner, um, then people won't complain so much. I think another problem with the electoral college is that, you know, I mean, I get this with my students all the time. My younger students uh, come in already convinced that, you know, they have no role in choosing a president and their vote doesn't count. And, and, and so we have a system. It doesn't work very well. And most people don't understand it. Uh, yet changing it is, is actually a pretty tall order. So, um, it, it's odd. It's a truly odd system. Uh, it, will it change sometime? I think so. Uh, but, you know, whether that's in, in our lifetimes, I can't begin to predict. Um, it, uh, since not everything about it is awful and not everything about it is good, what seems most likely is that we'll just continue to argue about it for some time. So, any questions about anything? Uh, I know that's a that's a pretty quick rendition of this thing. Uh, it is yeah. really yeah. Tru truly truly one of the strangest. Hang on, truly one of the strangest features of American government. Yes, please ask your question. Okay. Well, I've been trying to get onto this uh, <coughs> thing for oh uh, twenty minutes or more. I was a little late signing on, and so I don't have any idea what you guys are talking about. So my big question is, what are you talking about? The Electoral College. I'm I'm sorry you didn't get admitted sooner. I got on a roll there and forgot to look at the uh, at the at the yeah, waiting I, list. I, I'm, yeah. So what did you say about the Electoral College? Well, it's uh, in essence 51 separate state elections for president, including the District of Columbia. Every state gets electoral votes equal to the total size of its congressional delegation all but two states it's a winner take all election so if you win washington you get all of washington's 12 electoral votes the electors are real people they are chosen by the parties the only requirement is that they can't be sitting elected officials so from a school board member to a u.s senator you couldn't be an elector uh in early december all the electors go to their state capitals, the ones from the winning side, and they cast their ballots. Those are transmitted to Congress. And in January, Congress certifies the election. And uh, that's that's the very short version of what it is. And, and a lot of what I've been saying is that it's neither all bad nor all good. And, and certainly it's not popular with the majority of Americans, but, you know, that's something, changing it, changing it to what, you know? Do you have just a national popular vote that's, that's a free for all? Do you require that somebody has to have 50% plus one so that perhaps you have a, a runoff election as, as happens in some states? Um, so it, you know, it's, it's quite easy to say, well, we should do something different. And, and I think we probably should, but you have to write rules for that. You know, that has to look uh, a certain way. Um, if, if you had a system that in some way encouraged more candidates, uh, and you don't have some kind of primary election, uh, then, uh, that would divide the vote even further. Uh, it's like when people say, well, we need more political parties. And I'm thinking, oh, good, even less compromise. That'll help. So did I catch you up there? Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks <laughs> okay. a lot. You're That's so very good. welcome. I'm sorry I didn't get you in sooner. Oh, well. My bad. My bad. Other, other questions? Other questions? Dr. Joe, yeah. my question. Yeah, Dr. Joe. Jim, um, if that group on Jan, Jan, January 6th 
has been able to interfere with uh, activities that they wanted to interfere with. What kind of sequence of events do you think would follow? Well, they did. I mean, it was supposed to happen that day and it didn't happen until like three o'clock the next morning. Uh, so I, I simply presume this is what I think would have happened. OK, at some point, order would have been restored. Right. Clearly, there were enough people on both sides of the aisle who thought that this was a bad idea. Now, you have Republicans now inching back toward Trump because they understand, you know, he was popular with a lot of voters. And when you think about when I run for re-election, I'm going to have to have a primary election and those have low turnout. And if I totally disassociate myself from from the Trumpist wing of the party, I could get unelected. But on the whole, people were against sort of, in essence, the violent overthrow of the government. So it might have just taken longer to have certified the election, even longer than it did. Um, clearly, this was an utter fiasco from, from top to bottom. But in the end, the system held together, and, and I take that as a good sign. So, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Is there any other country that has a similar uh, no, no one else, no one else but us could think of anything this crazy. Um, the, the, the French system is uh, the, 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 the president and there's a president and there's a prime minister and, and they both have some power and um, they play some role in deciding, you know, what the government's going to look like. Uh, but that's the only thing that's remotely like this. Uh, in, in parliamentary republics, you know, you, you, elect, you elect members of parliament and they are become both the executive and the legislative and whoever can get a majority in parliament chooses a prime minister and then that person is is like the president except they're a member of parliament and they they have to maintain a majority uh so so that's an entirely different system than ours um i uh, certainly people i know including my own father from time to time will say well you know why don't we do that well um it would be different would it be better i don't know i mean it works okay uh, there is uh, less check on power, right? Because there really aren't different branches. Uh, court systems in those countries don't seem to have quite the same sway that courts do here. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you get a new majority in parliament, well, you can get something done. Uh, but we can look at a number of countries where nobody gets a majority. And so you have coalition governments, different parties trying to work together. Uh, Italy just, I think, uh, uh, collapsed, lost its 66th government since World War II. Uh, so, you know, elections can happen a lot more often in parliamentary systems. Um, so as with everything we've ever talked about, there are trade-offs here. Uh, in some countries you have, um, uh, proportional representation. So, so instead of electing people by district, uh, if your party gets 5% of the votes, well, then you get 5% of the seats in, in the legislative body. A lot of those countries have kind of a mixed system there where um, some of the parliamentary seats are apportioned by district and some in essence at large by which party is most popular. Uh, that elect electoral system encourages third parties because under those circumstances, you're, you're not throwing your vote away. If you're a libertarian and libertarians get 5% of the votes, well, then they'd get 5% of the seats in Congress uh, or a socialist or a green party. I mean, whatever, right? Uh, under the system that we have, voters and candidates are really encouraged to migrate to one of the two main parties. So we have a two party system simply because of the nature of our elections, since they're by district and they're winner take all. You, you really have to want to make a statement to vote for something other than a Republican or a Democrat. And as a consequence, those parties are much broader. So we have people who are who are Democrats in name only and and parties 
you know, Republicans in name only, but that's as close as they can get to a party or perhaps where they live. Gee, if I want to get elected, I better run as this and not that. So. Would you think that the January 6th uh, assault on the Capitol had a chance of unseating the results of the election? Um, I don't, I don't really think it did. You know, I really don't think it did because ultimately there was a reaction and they were able to clear the Capitol. And the fact that hundreds of those people have now been arrested and, uh, you know, may very well serve time as a result of this. Um, uh, so, you know, had they been able to uh, get to members of Congress and, and hold them hostage. I, I don't know. I just think all the possible scenarios, considering that this really wasn't, if heavily armed, it was still a small minority of Americans who wanted this. Um, uh, it seems unlikely that they would have gathered enough popular support to have pulled this off. I mean, we must remember that uh, clearly a majority of Americans did prefer Joe Biden over Donald Trump. Uh, 60 lawsuits thrown out, no evidence ever presented that there was really any anything making this election illegitimate. Uh, so while it was a big test for the system, I, I want to believe that the system was strong enough to... Uh, to withstand that. Now, that being said, uh, clearly the, the Capitol has security issues that have to be and, and are being addressed. Um, had a different person been in the White House, things, things might have not gotten quite so far. Uh, but uh, Trump was clearly encouraging these people and really took no steps to, uh, to, to make sure that this didn't happen or to stop it while it was happening. So. Um, uh, it, you know, it's it, it's a defining event of our age, uh, but in the end, we we seem to have survived it. So now, really, it's a question of will the Democrats, being more or less in power, be able to get anything done? And that's always the that's always the challenge. And and they have such small majorities in the House and Senate that it's not necessarily a given. Yes, Joe. Does does the vice president have the power to interfere with the that uh, settlement as as the people thought Pence did? Uh, no, I don't really think he does. Uh, and and Pence himself said, "No, I really can't do that." So you know, at the crucial moment, he was a stand up guy. Uh, and and you know, there's really nothing in the Constitution that says uh, the vice president can throw out the election results if he doesn't like them, because that's in effect what would be happening. So, what made him think that he could get to do that then? Uh, uh, he didn't think that. Um, uh, I mean, the yeah, no, uh, the, uh, well, clearly they were encouraged by by President Trump to uh, go there and fight, right? And and he kept and with the uh, assistance of Fox News painting this picture of an illegitimate election in which votes were stolen from him or not counted. And uh, as I was saying, there's simply no evidence that that was true. Nobody was able to provide any evidence. And, and, and honestly, the great majority of, of secretaries of state in every state, the people who are in charge of running the election, they're all Republicans. Uh, so, so, you know, you can't even say, well, it was, you know, the Democrats did us in here because, you know, the people who were counting the votes were in their boss was a Republican who was elected by Republicans in other states and, and Democrats, too. And and universally, they stood up and said, no, we counted the votes. This was a fair election. I mean, this was probably the cleanest, best washed election we've had in decades after, you know, the things that were appeared to be happening in 2016. So uh, these results are about as reliable as we could hope for, I think. So it's not enough to just say, I don't like this result, you know, overturn it. This is why we have elections, people choose. Other, other questions? Yes. Okay. This is way back 
<clears throat> something you said in the beginning. <clears throat> when Jefferson and Aaron Burr were tied, and that was during the time when that was the election of 1800. Yeah. 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 Uh, and you said that Jefferson became the president, but I don't know why. Uh, it went to the House. Oh, in the House? It went, it went to the House and the House decided. The yeah, house yeah, decided. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I don't, I don't think that many people actually wanted Aaron Burr to be president. And uh, well. And then, of course, later he he killed Alexander Hamilton yeah. in a duel, and uh, his life did not go well after that. So, no. um, yeah. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good, good question. Yeah. Other, other questions. You guys, you guys are easy today. Yeah. Yes. I, yes. Hypothetically speaking. Uh, what do you see happening now to Trump and his support in, a, in the Republican Party? Well, uh, clearly, there's still a lot of people who uh, liked what he had to say and felt like he did a good job. And obviously, people may agree or disagree with that suggestion. Um, um, but uh, uh, I, I think it, it will be a force for some time to come um, as... As the country slowly changes, I think that will go away uh, in in a number of states. Uh, Republicans have introduced uh, uh, bills in legislatures that would make it harder for people to vote. Um, whether those uh, will get passed or whether they would get thrown out by the courts remains to be seen. Uh, even, you know, I mean, there were judges that Trump had appointed who said, no, you don't have a case for election fraud here and throughout the cases. So so the, the, the court system is sort of in some ways functioning better than than some of us might have hoped for, uh, given the politics of of the day. Uh, that being said, um, you know, the other side of that is, well, what are the Democrats able to do? Are they are they able to seize the moment and and make progress? Um, you know, one thing for sure is if if we get a handle on the pandemic and the economy recovers, Democrats will win because they're in power when this is happening, almost regardless of how much they're responsible for it. So, you know, if you think about that, I mean, if not for the pandemic, Donald Trump is probably still president today uh, because there were enough people voting who seemed to think that what he was doing okay um, was okay. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of talk among some Republicans about breaking away and starting a different party, and I wish them well. Uh, I, I think there's a number of problems with that, one of which is the electoral system. As I said, you know, it's difficult to have multiple competitive parties under this system. Uh, the, the other problem is, is that when this has been attempted in the recent past in our state, and if you look at what these folks are for, it sort of warmed over Republicanism without the hate. And, and while I think that's much better, uh, I don't know that that's going to appeal to, to uh, enough voters for it to make a difference. Uh, you know, simply the idea that, you know, less regulation and lower taxes is the answer to all of our problems um, is, is at least debatable. Uh, you know, all we have to do right now is look at the state of Texas and their deregulation of the electric uh, market and what a fiasco that was when things went sideways. Without any regulation, there was nothing to either compel or reward electric utilities uh, for winterizing their equipment and they didn't and when it got really cold which it sometimes does in texas and with climate change it's probably going to happen more often that's what happened right and 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 the thing collapsed so um uh, i think you've got to have something more to sell than say the things that george w bush would have said less less regulation lower taxes that's going to fix everything and because I don't think it is. And certainly uh, there's enough people who think that's a bad idea. So it's not that they couldn't gain traction. I don't see that as, as, as a winning coalition for the Republicans at present. Um, uh, the Trump's wedge issues 
I think some folks found much more compelling demonizing the poor and immigrants and people of color for sadly that had traction with a lot of voters much more than uh, because you know all, all the can other Republican candidates in 2016 were saying pretty much the same thing what I just said to you lower taxes less regulation that's the answer and you know here comes Donald Trump and he says something completely different well he won so um, standard republicanism needs, I think, to have success, uh, a serious re-examination. You got to say something different. So, yes. How do you see the legal problem that Mr. Trump has affecting his plan to run the re-election? Uh, well, he says he wants to run again in 2024, but we'll see, you know, whether that really happens or not. I mean, that's a, an entirely separate question. Uh, on, on the other hand, the things I keep reading is that, you know, uh, the legal vultures are circling. Uh, Supreme Court just said, no, you got to turn over all these tax records, not just his returns, but his records. So he's facing multiple investigations around the country. Uh, defamation lawsuits from 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 women, um, uh, a, a lawsuit from people who got involved in a, in essence, a pyramid scheme that he created that didn't make them any money. Big surprise. Uh, and then a couple of uh, a couple of investigations in New York State, one of uh, about uh, the family's housing business and. And the other, of course, just about his taxes. And and the thing there is that he has, this came out a while ago, but he got a tax deduction available only to people who make a lot less money than he was claiming to make. So uh, there, there's a lot to be found out there. And now uh, prosecuting attorneys have access to this information. It's apparently millions of pages of documents. So this isn't going to happen in a hurry. Uh, uh, so he, he, he could end up a, a candidate again. He could end up sort of a footnote to history. So I think it's really too early to say, but I wouldn't want to be sitting where he is sitting Knock on my wooden head. Thank you. Yeah, good, good question. Other, other questions here. Jim, it's a separate topic. Sure. Are they still talking about capital gains tax in Olympia? Yes, they are. Um, and and of course, that's a very controversial sort of issue. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the threshold is high enough. There could be like only a dozen people in the state who would actually pay this tax. Uh, certainly, most of us never will. Uh, so if, if this tax has a hope of passing, you, you have to make clear that it is aimed at the 1% and not the 99%. But most people would never pay a capital gains tax. You, you know, you, you, you simply say it's on gains over a certain, a, a, a certain level. Um, the challenge that we face in Washington state is that our tax system does not capture, does not share in the gains in wealth in the state. So while the state's just gotten progressively richer, our tax collections as a percentage of that wealth keep falling every year. And that's because we're so dependent on sales tax and property tax and that strangest of creatures, the business and occupations tax. So um, if we simply adopted Idaho's tax system, now Idaho is not exactly a hotbed of li li liberalism, right? I mean, it's, it's congressional delegation and it's legislature and everything there is overwhelmingly Republican. If we adopted Idaho's tax system wholesale, just took it, we would take in $8 billion more a year. Now, I have no doubt the legislature would find a way to spend that. But the point is, is that uh, 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 our, our next door neighbor, a very conservative state, has a tax system that uh, is sort of more fair and evenly applied. In Washington state, the poor tend to spend a much higher percentage of their income on taxes than the wealthy do. 
Uh, I gather that's why Jeff Bezos decided to come here. We had no income tax. He recognized that he'd do pretty well living in Washington state. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's up to you to decide. Um, uh, but uh, so that could happen, but certainly it's such a controversial hot button issue. And uh, the people who would oppose this tax, I would predict, would probably do a very good job of convincing voters that this was just step one on the way to a, a total cashectomy for an average person in the state. So, um, <coughs> other, other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, sure. Um, uh, uh, Reagan brought about the idea that government is the problem. And do you think the plan that Biden has can help to change those attitudes? About yeah, well, I mean, if it has success, yes, of course, it would, it would move in that direction. I think the other thing that happened, I mean, certainly uh, Ronald Reagan tapped into that and used it to get elected twice. Uh, uh, and, and we can certainly find examples where, you know, government did too much. So it's not that that never happens. Um, on, on the other hand, um, the notion that everything is better in the private sector is also at least debatable. I think the other problem is, is that since Ronald Reagan, Democrats have been playing defense. I rarely, if ever, hear a Democratic candidate or elected official get up and say, no, here's why we think this is a good idea we should do this and this is how this will make your life better. Uh, Democrats are, I'm sorry, singularly inept when it comes to campaigning for what it is that they believe in. And the Republicans are very good at that. So that to me is at least as big a problem as, you know, making things work. Um, uh, uh, you know, as I've said before, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, a 19th century uh, uh Supreme Court Justice said, taxes are the price of civilization. You know, it, the notion that, that you know, we can have an, an utterly libertarian society in which government does almost nothing and people don't pay taxes and are simply responsible for themselves. Um, I don't think that would work. Others may disagree. I think we have examples of a government that looked like that in the second half of the uh 19th century the 1800s and it wasn't pretty right you had child labor you could get shot for joining a union uh you know their children were chained to machines in factories so they wouldn't run away um it, 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 it was not a system that was working for the majority of the people that's my opinion you you may disagree but that but the democrats need to learn how to make a case for what it is that they want to do. And the few times I've gotten to talk to candidates about that, I've tried to say that, and it's, uh, it, it seems to have fallen on deaf ears. Uh, I, I don't think they quite grasp, and, and too many of them think, well, I'm not going to convince those people anyway. Well, you need to, right? You need to convince those voters probably in the middle that, look, if you make this choice, your life will be better. Uh, so, uh, if Biden has success, uh, and, and he might, you know, he, he was an effective legislator. He did some dumb stuff. He did some good stuff. Uh, he's willing to admit his mistakes, but he sort of knows how the game is played. Uh, and I think he has some chance of making some things happen that would, would help Democrats for better or for worse. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, but, um, Clearly, he has an opportunity there, uh, not quite as big an opportunity as President Obama had, who I think totally muffed it, um, uh, but an opportunity there to change the national dialogue about the role of government in society. So, Okay, thank you. That's, that's, that's all uh, behind my thinking is what's been happening in the last few years. I'm sorry, can you say that again? That's been behind my thinking in the last few years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mine, mine too, mine too. Other, other questions? I have another question. Sure. 
Do you think the Electoral College can survive the new, all the new media uh, we have in this day? Do I think the Electoral College can survive all the new media? Yeah, technology and things like oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, there's a couple ways to think about that. One of which is, is uh, uh, and this isn't, I know exactly what you meant, but it always comes to mind. I like to call it the Star Trek myth. You watch old episodes and pick a Star Trek series. They thaw out somebody from the 20th century and, and they say, you know, well, we're all better people now. We've solved the problem of human want, etc. And And I just think that's a pipe dream. I mean, I, I was explaining to somebody earlier today, look, if you, if you read Aristotle and Plato, okay, who wrote 2,500 years ago, they are talking, they were talking about the very same things we're talking about today in very similar terms. Uh, so I, I I don't, I don't think technology is going to change that any more than 2,500 years did. Uh, certainly, people have more access to information. They also have more access to misinformation. Um, uh, social media is, has proven to be a way to connect people. But uh, still, and somebody else said this first, um, uh, revolutions are won by boots on the ground. So all the social media in the world won't matter if people don't show up and vote, show up and campaign, show up and protest for the things that they want. So while this maybe helps people connect, it, it isn't necessarily an assurance that there will be action. Uh, and some candidates have used social media very effectively. Certainly the, the, the president did. Ultimately, I think it was part of his downfall because he, he didn't know when to stop tweeting. Uh. <laughs> um, you know, this the, the Electoral College is written into the Constitution, so we're not going to get, I mean, getting rid of it would, in, would involve a huge number of states yes. voting to yes. change the Constitution. Yes, yes, you'd need a constitutional amendment, and that's either two-thirds vote in the House and Senate, and right now you'd be hard-pressed to get them to two thirds vote to agree that a blue sky is a nice thing. Uh, at plus, I believe it's 38 states have to ratify uh, to get that passed. The other alternative is a constitutional convention and that opens up you know, the whole thing. Some people say, oh, you could limit it to two or three issues. I don't really see how that's possible. If there's a constitutional convention, they can decide to write a whole new document and I'd have to be convinced that somehow that was going to be really that much better than the one we have. So while it's possible to change the constitution clearly, as you say, as you noted, it's not easy. So getting rid of the electoral college is a, is a, is a taller hurdle than, than we might think. And then of course, what do you replace it with? And the more I think about that, the less obvious it becomes what that might look like, because as always, there's there's trade offs. You have a national primary, you have regional primaries. You just let the parties put forth their candidates and anybody could run. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's certainly possible that that it could just be a, a free for all and even harder to figure out. I mean, what if nobody gets a majority? Do you have a runoff? Those are the kinds of things that we have to think about. I would prefer to see something that ends up with 50% plus one. You know, uh, I don't like uh, things. This gets proposed increasingly uh, rank choice voting in which you would vote for your top candidate and then you just go down the list and number them in order of preference and then they lop the people off the bottom and redistribute the, those votes to the people on the top, you can end up with somebody that was like at best everybody's third choice and they win through this system. And now we've elected somebody that nobody really wanted. So I don't think that would be better. They tried that in Tacoma and they got somebody that nobody really wanted. So who did a terrible job, but whatever he was doing. Hmm. Other, other questions? It's four o'clock, it's time for tea. <laughs> 
I'd love to share a cup with you, but that'll have to wait till things get better. All right. Well, in a month, we will talk about uh, Washington State agencies and all the things that they do, some of the larger and more interesting ones. And I hope that you'll find that interesting. We'll touch on the state budget a little bit there and sort of what these things cost and what they're supposed to do for us. Uh, and my general tenor tends to be that it, it is by no means perfect. It is not without problems. But on the whole, our state's government doesn't work too badly, uh, other things being equal. So anyway, lovely to be with you all. I hope you have a great rest of the day and a good weekend. And I look forward to being with you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.